Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. Today, Dick and I are so uh, fortunate to be able to have a conversation with Henry Giroux, who currently holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest in the English and Cultural Studies Department, and is the Paolo Fer Ferrari Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy. Thank you for being with us today. You know, um, Dick and I, I I'm, I just feel so um, fortunate to have, have access to your content. Uh, we read your piece that you've graciously allowed us to publish in the LA Progressive uh, on the necessity of critical pedagogy. We read it together. And I'm like, I, I, you know, as, as I got through it, I was like, yes, 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 yes. This is what we need. This is what we need. So, um, Let's let's start by talking about what is critical pedagogy, because I have to admit to you that probably as recently as five years ago, I had never heard the word pedagogy before. You know, it, it, it's really interesting because um, I've been using this word for about 30 to 40 years. Right. And the word really emerges in some ways out of the work that Paulo Freire was doing in his literacy campaign in Brazil, which was using education, teaching and learning in, in a way that suggested that it was eminently political because literacy is not just about giving people the skills and the knowledge they need to understand the world. It, it also provides the conditions for them to intervene in the world. And I think that, you know, for me, pedagogy is a moral and political practice in that, for instance, uh, around the question you can't you can't separate questions of education from questions of power. It's it's literally impossible. Not only because the conditions in which educators work, whether in the public schools or in higher education, is eminently tied to how power bears down on them. Do they have control over the conditions of their labor? Uh, are they being told what to teach as they are now? Are they being fired for what they say? Uh, but even in the classroom itself, we make choices as educators around books, around social relationships, around how we view the future. So in, in a sense, but more importantly, how we define the relationship between education power. And are you ready for this? For the production of identities, you know, for, for the production of subjects, for the production of particular modes of agency. Remember that great line from Malcolm X in his autobiography? when he goes to the guidance teacher and he says, well, I want to do this. And, and the guidance teacher says, oh, Malcolm, you can't do that. You, you should really work in the trades, work with your hands. And that's a perfect illustration in some way of how identity gets shaped and crippled in the name of education. And, and so for me, you know, there's a line that I've always used that I liked a lot. And it, and it goes something like the first casualty of authoritarianism are the minds that would oppose it. Mm. And that's the essence of education, right? Education is fundamentally about consciousness, about raising it, about learning how to be critical, about learning how to be informed, and about learning that it never stops. So that question of pedagogy is not just about schooling. You know, I mean, how we teach and learn in some fundamental way goes on in, the, in multiple spheres. And so when we expand, expand that question of pedagogy, uh, you know, and uh, with the understanding that it has implications for the boardroom, <laughs> you know, it has implications for the media, all of a sudden education becomes central to politics. And I think that what I've tried to do in this piece, particularly this piece, which is an original piece that I sent you for you, because, uh, you, know, you know, as you know, it's not it's not a reprint. Uh, I wanted people to, I wanted young people and teachers to see this and to have a sense of going into the school year, having a sense of a language they could use to both understand what they do. Because to give you another definition, pedagogy is always interventionist. It's not neutral. It's, it's not about people being objective. It's about people bringing their values to bear on the knowledge they choose, the relationships they legitimate, the arguments they make, and the future that they speak to. So that in some fundamental way, they're aware that education has to be on the side of justice and truth and not on the side of methods. Education, pedagogy is not a method. It's not some a priori discourse that you can simply impose regardless of context. 
And that's another issue. I mean, the ped critical pedagogy says this, that's really important. It says you cannot divorce teaching, not only from politics and power, you can't divorce it from context. Context matter. The histories that kids bring to the classroom from the communities and the historical backgrounds that they understand is crucial. And I'll give you an example, if I may. Is that okay? Oh, of yes, course. please. When I was a kid, I grew up in a working class neighborhood where they talked about unions all the time. They talked about, and this will give you a sense of my age, they talked about the wobblies. <laughs> you know, I mean, they talked about union struggles. And then I went to school. And all I heard in school was about the history of great white men who crossed from one continent to the next. <laughs> I was not in that narrative. I was never in that narrative. And, and I think in some fundamental way, it wasn't meaningful to me, education. I, my experiences were at odds. I mean, I, I grew up around workers. I grew up around union people. I grew up around people organizing in communities. These were political people. And all of a sudden, education became a dead zone of the imagination. And I think that one of the crucial elements in pedagogy is a very simple formulation that links the question to the theoretical, the political, and the contextual, and maybe power itself. And I always tell myself this before I walk into a classroom, and that is, how do you make something meaningful to make it critical, to make it transformative? Any one of those elements, if they're missing, undermines the ability of what it means to be a critical pedagogy, to be a, a, a critical educator. So it's a moral and political practice. It takes seriously questions of context. It's never unrelated to questions of power. And it's always asking fundamental questions. As I say in the piece I sent you, whose knowledge is this? Whose interest does it serve? Where does it come from? What needs to be unlearned in light of what we've learned? How do we talk about the collective good? You know, how do we link what we teach to a vision in which students can write themselves into the script of democracy? How do we legitimate those values that absolutely are critical of hatred, racism, attacks on trans people? I mean, these are all fundamental questions. And I'll end it with this, Sharon, with respect to your question. There's been a lot of talk in the last 10 years about the attack on critical race theory, the banning of books, and so forth and so on. And it's all important stuff, and it truly is going on. But what too many people have missed is that behind those attacks is a much more broader attack, and that's on critical pedagogy itself. Mm -hmm. Not on a specific area, right? Not on just the elimination of history regarding slavery and racism. It's an attack on the very foundation of what it means to think, to be critical, to be alive. They want to the right, that is, they want to eliminate any critical faculties whatsoever that you would associate with schools, higher education, with teaching, and with learning. They, they really are dead zones of the imagination. They really are. I mean, they want to kill the imagination, turn people into white Christian nationalists, put them into the, the global labor force and make sure that they never really question people like Trump, you know, who represent the antithesis of, of critical pedagogy. So, so Henry, in the decades since you and I were college students, uh, your article and you say that kind of the nature of education has changed at one time, at least the ideal was that it was supposed to empower people to give them agency to to let them think for themselves to to understand the world in in a real way and, and draw their own conclusions and over the decades education has changed for some at least into uh rote memorization to make people better workers so yes. as, a, as a longtime university professor, how, how were those forces pressed upon you to make those changes and how did you resist them? I mean, I think there are a couple of issues here. You know, if we go back to the 60s and the 50s, I mean, it was very interesting because the debate, particularly around public education, was really relatively simple. You educated people to be workers, you educated work people to be students to be citizens. That was the debate. That was it. Or you, you, you sort of, it, then it went a bit further and said, well, you know, we're failing as a nation and we're not well prepared. We, you know, we've got to do more STEM subjects. But it was operated within a limited kind of ideological 
can, can, I, can I just interrupt here? You said that was the debate, whether or not we educate this, the, up, the new generation to be citizens or to be workers. Who was having this debate? The debate was going on primarily between progressives who were coming out, coming out of the Dewey tradition and conservatives who were basically embracing and had embraced education as being fundamental to the workplace. And, and, and as a matter of fact, you even see the legacy of that debate inhabiting a whole range of progressives after uh, Reagan. I mean, people like Clinton, people like Obama, they were pathetic around education, right? They were on the side of educating people for the workplace. They called it educating for the test. They were terrible. I, I mean, they, they, they actually moved away from the Deweyan progressive social construction tradition in education, which was really powerful in the 50s and clearly in the 60s in higher education. I, I mean, exploded, right? around the, the claim that education should be for democracy. You know, remember Mario Savio? Shut down the machine, right? We got to shut this machine down. It was a very different kind of radical language. Everything changed in the 80s. Everything changed. Everything changed because all of a sudden, the right realized that the war was not just economic, it was over ideas. Right. You know, and, and whether whether you and Chomsky has talked about this many times. I, I mean, you know, when, when, when you, you, you look at the, the emergence of these think tanks and, you know, these anti-public intellectuals who are now saying they put a different spin on this. Right. They weren't just saying attacking communists as they did in the McCarthy era. They were saying that educators were aiding the war on terror with Bush. Under Reagan, they were saying, get rid of Angela Davis, get rid of the left. You know, it's all going to change. And all of a sudden, the struggle became around schooling became far more ideological and dangerous and far more threatening. I mean, you probably don't remember in the 80s uh, after the war on 9-11, and particularly after 9-11, when, when Dick Cheney's wife became the head of the humanities, Lynn Cheney, and issued a statement saying those people who are criticizing the United States by virtue of 9-11, are really aiding the war on terrorism. All of a sudden, people in, 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 in higher education became terrorists who were critical. Mm -hmm. and now take that further into, into you know, where we are today. And it's not just a matter of shaming the left or shaming people who are educators who are critical. It's not just a matter of saying you should educate for the workplace. So that, that argument is not even, that's just a given now. That's not even argued anymore. They've taken it a step further. We don't want you just to be workers. We want you to be white Christian nationalists. <laughs> we want to purge from the universities uh, any notion of a critique of Israel. We want to, we want to claim that uh, freedom of speech and academic freedom don't apply when it comes to addressing one of the most profound moral political crises of the times. We don't want you to speak out. Uh, and the, so the level of oppression coupled with the level, the level of literal repression coupled with the, the right, this right wing indoctrinating ideology, it represents a whole different moment, it seems to me, in the repression of schools, because they're now inside the schools. You understand? They're inside, right? They're firing teachers. They're, they're shaping curricula. They're banning books. Uh, they're not just saying, as Lynn Cheney said, we need to put more trustees into a conservative that would hire a conservative faculty. We're way beyond that. So when you say that they're inside the school, they're not inside the school as educators at first. They're inside the school as controlling the schools. Yes. From the yes. top. From the yeah. top, they're inside the schools. Well, well, actually, Sharon, I'm, as you well know, both you and Dick, I'll give you an example where they are inside the schools. New College in Florida. Mm. Um, I, yeah, they are inside the schools. They have they have fired the president. They have ad, they have hired you know an an incredibly right wing administrative staff. They've gotten rid of faculty who in any way are progressive, and they increasingly are hired hiring all these faculties who aren't even qualified in some way to teach. I mean, they have done that. They, they have become the model in some way modeled after that Christian school. Hill is it? Hill, it's Hillsdale, right? Remember Hillsdale? 
I mean, Hillsdale now is going around the country creating videos with Prager and all these right-wing institutions. Yes. They're inside the school. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, if teachers don't have the liberty to teach what they want and are being forced to teach this nonsense, you know, that slavery wasn't all that bad. Jesus, I, I mean, where do you end with this? You know, windmills cause cancer? I don't know. Uh, you know, you they're inside. They're shaping the curriculum. And the next step is the, and we're seeing it right now, the next step is to fire faculty, take away tenure. And I think four or five states now, and certainly Florida is one of them, uh, and Wisconsin is another one. Tenure doesn't exist anymore, Sharon. It doesn't exist. They have five-year renewals. And if they, you don't, you, and of course, you look at the board of trustees who govern these places, and they say, well, you know, your work is not relevant to what it means to uh, be professional. Bye. You're done. You're done. You know, I saw this happening in 1982. I was at, I don't know if you know this story, but it's probably worth repeating briefly. I was at Boston University from 77 to 1982. And during that period, you had the rise of Ronald Reagan in California, of course, going after Angela Davis and the so-called communists, right? What people forget is on the East Coast, you had somebody who was worse than him. He was called John Silver, and he was the president of Boston University. He made a public speech, he made a speech not knowing there was a reporter in the room in which he said, I have made Boston University a great place. We have eliminated all the people doing critical education. We have eliminated all the people doing radical African, African American history. We've gotten rid of all the family. I mean, literally said this, right? I went up for tenure, unanim passed unanimously. He denied me tenure. He called me in his office and he said, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't publish anything for two years and allow me to be your tutor <laughs> in philosophy, education, and uh, something else, he said, you can stay on for two years, blah, blah, blah. And we'll reconsider you for tender, tenure and freeze your salary during that period. You had the same salary. And I, and I turned to him and I said, what do you want to do? Turn me into George Will? <laughs> and I left. And I left, right? Uh, and, and I say that story because that was the beginning. That was the shift, right? There was a shift on both coasts. There was a shift in the sense that you had to now get rid of people who in any way were critical, who would somehow challenge the status quo, challenge American foreign policy, challenge domestic policy, and particularly challenge the rise of the corporate university. So, so clearly you're alarmed by this and have been for apparently for 40 years. And I'm sure you're not the only, only colleague and professor who is. So are, are, are professors organizing themselves in some fashion to, to fight these trends? Oh, I, I, absolutely. I, I mean, they don't have a choice. I mean, I mean and, and this organizing comes out of a collective failure. And the failure is that in the 80s and in the early 90s, 70% of the faculty was tenured. Right. Now, 30% of the faculty is tenured. University faculty should have gone on strike en masse. And they conceded to this. Maybe because it was slow. I don't know. You know, maybe because there wasn't a, a unifying force to in some way address this stuff. But I think now what we see we see is many people who are beginning educators are beginning to model themselves after the auto workers. That you know, you basically have to fight for you. You have to fight not institution per institution, but you need a collective uh, struggle that can basically in which different states and different faculty can work with each other to shut this stuff down. I mean, I think the big struggle right now is over academic freedom. You know, it, it's it's so it's so it's so obvious that it's being violated. Uh, it's so obvious that schools are under the 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 uh, administrators are un under the influence of billionaires, right wing billionaires, and you know right wing politicians that they have no choice but to begin to organize. And a number of educators are now talking about fighting back against a whole range of issues. Time will tell if that will emerge into a massive social movement aligned with other movements. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I was talking to my son, who, by the way, is an educator. And um, he's act, he's actually running for office right now in Southern California. 
And uh, I was reading a statistic to him that 30, I think it was 35% of Americans have a, uh, a four year degree and 15% have an advanced degree. I was, I was talking to him about himself because he has an advanced degree. I said, did you realize you know, only 15% of Americans have an advanced degree, which speaks to, in my mind, why it is that Donald Trump is actually giving um, Kamala Harris a run for her money. The fact that someone like that would have millions of followers, um, it, it, that's at the heart of it, is the lack of education, awareness, of critical thinking, of all of those things. I, I think you're absolutely right, Sharon. I can't tell you how much I, 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 I support that position and have written about it. I mean, I, I mean, what we have in the United States is a crisis, a crisis of consciousness, a crisis of ideas, and a crisis of literacy all of which are related to a crisis in education. And I think that what we are seeing with this enormous surge of manufactured ignorance is not only a crisis in schooling and a crisis in higher education, but a crisis in one of the most powerful pedagogical forms alive today that, that exists, and that is the media, the mainstream media. You know, I mean, if you go, as you well know, if you go to Fox News today after this debate, <laughs> and you look at the stuff that they're saying, I, I mean, and, and you recognize that they, they, they're speaking to millions of people. Or to give you another example, which is shocking, the Tucker Carlson thing that just happened. You know about this, right? No, I you, know, don't. He has, you, you know, he's the most powerful podcaster in the United States right now. You know that. Right? Yes. 20 million people, I believe, is his audience, right? He just had on for one, two hours an outright unapologetic Nazi historian right. who, who claimed, made the claim that Hitler was really not a bad guy and the, it was all Winston Churchill's fault and that uh, Paris is worse off today given the Olympics and the showcasing of uh, LGBT people than it was under Hitler and that the execution of six million Jews was really an administrative problem meaning that they simply didn't have the food to feed them, so they had to somehow find a way to get rid of them. So it really wasn't a Holocaust. I mean, I mean, really? So This is the 21st century. I, I mean, I, th I think, you know, I think it's you're, you and I are on the same page. We really are at a crisis. I think that the division, the divides that exist because of race, stop the progressives from coming together. Yeah, I do too. And we need to come up with solutions for that. Yeah. Because if we don't, it's going to represent the demise of both of you and me. I mean, I, I, I think that what's going on here are three things, right? One is, let's get over the notion that democracy and capitalism are the same. They're but, not the same. No. It's, that's out of the question. They're antithetical to each other. They're, they're, they're antithetical. They're totally antithetical. So you, we need to begin to think about anti-capitalist values and what they mean and how they can take on a meaning educationally that would cut across a whole range of venues, from schools to higher public schools to higher education to alternative media. Secondly, it seems to me we need to, uh, we need a larger narrative that brings these difference these differences together, right? In which any one of those differences is important to point to particular forms of oppression, but lacks an overall totality that would be mobilizing and bring different groups together, i.e. You can say, I'm I'm a feminist, but I'm also a racist, right? I don't like black people. Well, if that's the case, then you can't be part of a radical democracy. Yeah. Right. Right. Radical democracy is the narrative. I mean, at what point do the, do the lack of these differences, the particular differences, point to a way that invalidates democracy itself? So that larger narrative around radical democracy is absolutely essential. And it seems to me we need to use it, we need to defend it, call it what you may. I'm not sure, I mean, socialist democracy, I use it, but I, I like radical democracy even better, you know? Thirdly, we need a national third party movement. You know, we need, I mean, it can't be Harris versus Trump, right? She supports fracking. I mean, she talks, she says, uh, the, the, what happened in Gaza began October 7th. I'm sorry. It began in 1948. Is she nuts? Do you think that under our current system that we will ever really know what she thinks? She's speaking what she knows will pass muster for the deep-pocketed uh, funders. Of the, I mean, 
the who system who will get her elected. Right. You, you sound you sound you sound just like my wife. Yeah. <laughs> That is exactly what Rania says every time that I raise this issue. And you know what? You're both right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I, I think to the degree within this system, based on massive degrees of concentration of wealth and inequality, if you if you really believe that these people aren't in some way indebted to a corporate elite, whether they're liberal or whether they're just simply proto-Nazis, you really have failed to understand something. One is how the concentration of power is at work in the long run to promote authoritarianism. Right out. That's it. Secondly, you tend to believe, I think, the most powerful, hegemonic, dominating ideology of the times, which is all problems are individual problems. That's right. So so I think it's important to understand that that this trend in education didn't happen. It, it didn't evolve naturally. It was part of a plan, I think, to I think to dumb down the populace so they would be workers rather than oh, thinkers, right. and 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 raise the tuition rate be out of sight so a lot of students wouldn't even consider going to college, and if they did go to college, they would be pushed into technical skills so they could go join a a company after school. But it wasn't accidental. I mean, the the the, the elites that control the country. Are, are very happy about these changes. And I, I want to insert something here because these changes that you're speaking of coming from, um, for me, as a Black female who grew up during the 60s, I came from a, a, a Black family in the Bronx, in the projects. We were already oppressed. There was no this shift in education. We were already being prepared to be workers. So it was enlightening for me to even know that there were people who were being trained to be thinkers. You know, who this, this critical pedagogy, there's a reason that I never heard of the word pedagogy. Pedagogy would never have, that word would never have come out of the mouth of anybody that I was raised around because we were already in this pocket where oppression was the name of the game. I, I think that to simply suggest uh, and, I, and this needs to be clarified, to suggest that there was a progressive moment in the way education was defined does not eliminate the fact that those of us who were at the bottom of the, of the class structure, the racial structure, uh, you know, were in schools that were utterly progressive. They weren't progressive. I mean, that was just a larger debate that was basically about middle class schools. That was largely about ruling class schools. Uh, I, I mean, when, when, you know, when I, I grew up in the neighborhood like you, I had three choices, right? I mean, it'd be a fire, and I'll use the masculine pronoun, be a fireman, be a policeman, or be a priest. That was it. You know, there was no other alternative. I remember taking the SATs to go to college, and I drew a map on them, and I scored 220. The lowest you can score is 200. And they called me into the office, and they said, how many fingers do you see? The point being, for them, that was a psychological problem. If I had been a ruling class kid, they would have called me in the office and said, do you have a tutor? <laughs> what yeah. can we do? What resources can we bring to bear? Do you understand? To, to really help you. That one of the things that I often tell my students, I told them this the other day. I said, you don't, if you don't understand the relationship between constraints and choices, you're going to miss something. And that is, you live in a country that says everybody has a choice, everybody has individual freedom, anybody can do it. Well, when the constraints are overwhelming, you live in poverty, you live in fear, you live in a culture of crime. You could be arrested at any moment. You could be thrown in jail tomorrow. Those choices are so limited as to be almost impossible. But when you grow up in a prep in a middle class, upper class neighborhood where you have tutors, you know. Look, I worked in a bank with a guy once, and he, I, I, we were talking about the police. I said, the police in my neighborhood, they throw their club. They had billy clubs. Then they throw the clubs at your legs on the weekend to try to hit you, and it's a joke for them. He said, no. The police people in my neighborhood, if we get in trouble, they take us home. <laughs> so so D Dick and I have a story. When when we got married, I, I had, Dick is not my first husband. And I was married to a black man for 17 years. He's the father of my children. And he would get pulled over. Dick and I together, he gets pulled over. Very different experience. The police oh. have pulled Dick over a couple of times. I've been in the car with him. I'm so angry. <laughs> that I, I I cannot look at the police officer because I really want to spit at him. I want to spit at him because he's so respectful and kind to my husband. 
and he treats my son like shit um, because the experience is so different. And, and even when you talk about the SAT and drawing the map, my parents never heard of an SAT and I yeah, never yeah. took the SAT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, I, I mean, but this is very important, right? Yeah. Because what we're talking about is the scourge of capitalism, which touches everything, which is inequality. It's inequality. Come on. I mean, you know, when the resources go to 0.5%, yes. and they have political power, they have economic power, they have cultural power, they have social power, and now they've learned something important, very important. They learned that thinking is dangerous, just as Hannah Haran said. Thinking is dangerous, and they want to not just shut down the individuals who think and shame them, whether they be Angela Davis or Herbert Marcuse or, you know, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky. They want to, and they've learned, and this is very important, they want to shut down the institutions, the public institutions that make thinking possible. So that, for instance, when Trump, after the debate, says, we're going after NBC, ABC, we're going after them. Jesus, I mean... Does anybody get what that suggests, right? The implications of that are right out of Nazi Germany. They're right out of Pinochet's Argentina, right? I mean, they're right out of the torture chambers in, in various countries, whether it be in Turkey or Iran, who knows? But, but as you said, Sharon, when ignorance is coupled with power, to quote James Baldwin, that's the most poisonous kind of politics you can imagine. I mean, it's not when, when, when Trump cut up, you know, it, we all know this line. I love the uneducated. Of course he does. Of <laughs> course he does. Who will doubt that? I don't want people to think. I, I will save you. I'm your hero. You know, as Ruth Ben Gaetz has been saying for 10 years, it's all about the strong man. You know, and what the strong man does is says, you don't have to think. And don't worry, those people who will try to make you think will kill them. Yeah, yeah. So, Henry, you were saying that there are educators who are trying to come together. I mean, give us a ray of hope. What? Oh, I, I mean, look, when I look at the Black Lives Movement and the way they have taken on education, when I look at scholars like Eddie Claude Jr., when I look at people like, especially, I love this guy, Robin Kelly, you know, my friend. He's here. <laughs> LA. I've been trying to reach him because he wrote a book and his book is, is about... Um, Mm, it's behind me somewhere. So it's in this is musician. Anyway, it's it's unimportant. If you wrote a book about Thelonious Monk, is Thelonious that the one? Monk, right? <laughs> Thelonious Monk, who was raised with my dad in the Bronx, and and he's got people that he. I I, I will send, send you his family. email, Robin. I, I'm, I'll send you his email. He has a different right. email. I'll send you his email, okay. Robin. I mean, but people like Robin, people, Angela Davis. You know, I mean, I mean these feminists who are rising up, these black feminists. Uh, the uh, the earlier, of course, my friend, uh, what was her name, who just died, Bell Hooks, you know. Uh, I, I mean, we, we, we see a whole range of, of, of people in, in, in many ways who, you know, are fundamentally raising their voices in a way that suggests a new level of civic courage and a new level of merging politics, power, and education. And that's very, very important. I mean, very important. You're absolutely right. Well, this was delightful, Henry, and as will, always. That's right. And we will keep promoting your work, the works of the people, some of the people you mentioned. I uh, interviewed um, Melina Abdullah um, a couple of days ago. She's one of the uh, the founders of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. You know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement took a really big hit because um, some people came and, and have taken over. Um, so there's a fight there. But we have to keep lifting up these voices and these ways of thinking, because if we don't, I, it just looks so bad for our future. I, 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 if I may say one last thing, you know, this struggle today, the most important element of this struggle, educationally, politically, economically, socially, is with young people. It's with young people. Their future is at stake in a way in which our future wasn't at stake. Far more dangerous far more apocalyptic. I mean, the planet could end. I, I mean, Trump gets elected, you know, we're going to burn up, right? I, I mean, fascism everywhere. Uh, but they're smart. I mean, I, I have to tell you, the students that I have now from my classes at McMaster, these kids are smart. They're smart. They think 
they they think in a way that's intersectional. You know, they bring things together. They don't buy this stuff, this bullshit racism. I mean, they don't buy it. You know, they're not buying it. And they're trying to figure out what the tools that they have and the media they have. And I tell them, look, it's not enough to be a cultural critic. You've got to be a cultural producer. Right. You got to be a cultural. You have to learn how to produce television shows. You have to learn how to work the media. You have to learn how to print newspapers or magazines. You have to learn how to be a force in which you're not working for somebody else who's going to limit the, the, the genius and the possibilities and the vision that you have. Yes. Well, Henry, it's been another great chat. We look forward to continuing to publish your your articles. Um, we try our best to get as many eyes on your words and as many ears to listen to your interviews. It's definitely insightful and mind expansive. Thank you so much for being with us. Let me just say, look, thank you so much for all you do. You know, not just for me. I, I, I can't tell you. I'm in love with both of you. You know, I, I mean, you're just a, it's just a terrific example of two very courageous people trying to make the world a better place you know oh, thank you thank, thank you so you. much okay have a good one all right bye-bye thank you for sticking around if you like the la progressive content and the discussions we have here please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up that helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.